One Tuesday morning, a developer sits down at their desk, opens up their laptop. They look at some dashboards, maybe. Oh, hey, what is this blip in the error rate? Could that possibly be related to the change I pushed yesterday? Hmm, they open up their log aggregator and they, they type in a query. Take a sip of coffee. Might as well go get another cup. That's it. That's the whole story. They never get back to that question. Maybe, maybe their kid walked in and distracted them. Maybe they got an email. Who knows? Their attention's gone. I'm Jessica Kerr, Jessitron. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about how at Honeycomb, we use serverless functions to speed up our database servers. I want to give credit to Ian Wilkes, who told me this story initially because he's our primary database engineer, and Liz Fong Jones. She's responsible for a lot of this story too. I'm going to talk about how serverless is useful to us at Honeycomb, uh, not for answering web requests, but for on-demand compute. And then I'll talk about some of the ways that it was tricky, some of the obstacles that we overcame uh, to get this working smoothly. And finally, how you might use serverless, some things to watch out for, what kind of workloads you might use this for. Let's go. First, I need to tell you why we use serverless at all. So we use Lambda functions on AWS Lambda uh, to supplement our custom data store, whose name is Retriever. Now. Your first question there should definitely be, why do you have a custom data store? Because the answer to let's write our own database is no. But in our case, our founders tried that and it turned out that we are really specialized. Retriever is a special purpose data store for real time event aggregation for interactive querying over traces, over telemetry data for observability. Oh, now why would we want to do that? Because Honeycomb's vision of observability is highly interactive. Uh, people should be able to find out what's going on in their software system when they need to know, not just learn that something's wrong, but be able to ask what's wrong? How is this different? What does normal look like? A, a repeated question structure, always get to new questions. So the difference for us between monitoring and observability is in monitoring, uh, you decide up front what you want to watch for. You maybe watch for everything that has been a problem in the past, maybe. And then when you want to graph over that, you can graph that over any period of time and it's really fast because you've stored it in a time series database. You've done all the aggregating already. In Honeycomb, like you don't yet know what you are going to need to ask about production data. So dump it all into events. We'll put it into retriever and then we'll make every graph then we'll make every graph fast. Uh, so at each different field that you might want to group by or aggregate over each different aggregation you might want to do from a simple count to a P50 or a P90 or a P99 or a heat map over the whole distribution. Our goal is to make all of these graphs fast so that you can get the information you need and immediately start querying it for more, more information. It goes kind of like this. So say I want to know how long our Lambda functions take to execute. What's the average execution time? Not always the most useful, useful metric, but we can use it today. Okay, so I know I need to look in Retriever's data set for something in Lambda, but I don't remember the name of the spans I'm looking for. So I'll just ask it for group by name, give me all the different names of the spans. Aha, I recognize this one, invoke. I'm looking for invoke. So next question, run this query, but show me only the invoke spans. Uh, oh, okay, got that's back. Next query, show me the average of their durations. All right, I can scroll down and I can see what that is. And then I get curious. This is important. I'm like, why is this so spiky? What is going on over here where it's like 
super jumpy and the the count is way higher and the the average duration is bouncy and I'm like wow look at this look at that spike in in the p50 of the duration median duration um down there let me let's see I'll heat map over that it doesn't look like they're particularly slower in the distribution but let's say okay what is different about these spans compared to everything else in the graph and honeycomb does a statistical analysis of what's going on um, and then we can scroll down and we can see what's different okay it looks like for the spans in this box i drew they're mostly from queries okay and they have a single trace id so they're from this particular query okay so now next aggregation give me only the spans inside this trace so now I'm seeing all the invocations in this one query. Okay, but now I want to know, like, what query were they running that, like, made it take so long? All right, so instead of looking for the invocations, let's look through this trace, but let's find something with, like, a query spec in it. And now I'm going to get back probably just one span. Oh, a couple spans. Okay. Oh, Retriever Client Fetch. I recognize that name. That's the one that's going to tell me what... Uh, what this particular customer was trying to do. Now, if I flip over to raw data, then I can see all of the fields that we sent in retrieval client fetch. Oh, oh, look, there's the query spec right there. Yeah, give that, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it looks hard. Some queries that customers run are definitely harder than others. But the point is to get this interactive feel, this back and forth, this dialogue going with your production data so that you can continue to ask new questions over and over. And for that, it has to be fast. It has to be really fast. Like if, if, if I hit run query and then I take a sip of coffee, okay, now I should have my answer. If I have to go get another cup, complete failure. We've lost we've lost that developer or that SRE um, and that's not good enough. So the emphasis on this is on the interactivity here. 10 seconds is a little slow. One second is great, uh, but a minute right out. How do we do this? Okay. Architecture of Retriever. Um, customers send us events. We put them in the database <laughs> and then um, developers and SREs and product and whoever uh, runs the queries from our, our web app. Of course, uh, the events come in Kafka, which makes that this is not weird. Um, and naturally, we partition them. Uh, so Retriever is a distributed data store. And uh, there's a retriever to read off of each topic. Actually, there's I didn't draw two, but there's two retrievers to read off of each topic so that we have redundancy there. Um, and it reads all the events and then it writes them to local disk because local disk is fast. Uh, in memory is too expensive. Anywhere else is slower. So it writes all these things to local disk and um, that's quick. So the more retrievers we have, the more local disks we have. Then when a query comes in, it comes into one retriever and that retriever says, oh, okay, uh, this data set has data in these this many other partitions, sends off... Um, inner queries to all of those retrievers so that they can access their local disks. And then there's a big MapReduce operation going on. It comes back to the retriever you asked and it responds to the UI. Okay, so that's the, the distributed part. Uh, the next trick to making this really fast is that retriever is a column store. And it's been a column store since before these were super cool, but it's still super cool. Um, so every field that comes in with an event goes in a separate file. Uh, that's, that's fine. This is how we scale um, with quantity of fields on the event because at Honeycomb, uh, we want you to send all kinds of fields and they can have all different values. We don't care uh, because we're only going to access the ones we need. So when a query comes in, um, the, if we're looking for service name equals lambda and name of the span is invoke and we're ag aggregating over the duration all retrievers going to look at is the service name the name and the duration columns 
uh, and the timestamp. There's always a timestamp associated with every query. So that's the next trick, is in order to segment this data, we use timestamp. Uh, at Honeycomb, we like to say we don't index on anything, but that's not quite true. We index on timestamp. Uh, so the data is broken into segments based on like, I think at most 12 hours or a million events or a certain number of megabytes in a, in a file. And then we'll roll over to the next segment. Um, and then we record like what timestamps um, are the earliest and latest in each segment. And that way when a query comes in, we're like, okay, the query has this time range. We're gonna get all the segments that overlap that time range. And we're gonna look th through uh, the timestamp file to find out uh, which events qualify. And that's how Retriever achieves dynamic aggregation of any fields across any time range at that interactive query speed. Okay, but then we have the problem of success and we've got bigger customers with more data coming in and data sets are getting bigger. And the thing is, our strategy used to be uh, whenever we run out of space for a particular data set, new segment starts, oldest segments get get deleted. And that was fine when the oldest segment was like a week old. The point is your current production data is what's most important, right? But we got data sets that were big enough that at our like maximum allocation for a data set, we were throwing away data from like 10 minutes ago. That's not okay. You need more than 10 minutes window into your production system. So well, we did what everybody does when there's too much data. We started putting it in S3. <laughs> so this time, instead of deleting the oldest segment, we're shipping it up to S3. And each retriever still takes responsibility for all of the segments in its partition. It's just that now we're not limited in storage, uh, so we can store it up to 60 days. And that's, that's a much, much better uh, time window than until we run out of space. That's more predictable. Uh, and then uh, those queries are going to be slower. They're not as fast as local disk, but it's that it's that uh, the most recent stuff that you query the most often, and that's what you want to be really fast. It's also the stuff that's the most urgent. So we're like, okay, so each retriever will just, um, when it needs some data that's older, uh, it'll go download those files from S3 and include those in the query. And it won't be quite as fast, but... Uh, but it, it'll be a lot more flexible because you have more data, right? That's good. Now people can run uh, queries over 60 days worth of data. Hooray! Oh no! <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, 60 days is a lot. How much longer is that going to take? And now we start to get, um, when, when you're reading from local disk, it's really fast, but as soon as you hit S3, the query time grows at least linearly with the number of segments that it has to download and query. And so if you, if you query for the last few minutes, yeah, you can take a sip of coffee. But if you query for the last few days, you might have to take a couple sips. And 60 days, it was, we, we had to change our maximum query timeout to an hour. Oh my gosh, that's way beyond a cup of coffee. That's like roast the beans and brew the pot. I hear you can roast beans. It doesn't take that long, but this took too long. So that was not okay. What are we going to do? Retriever is like, I need more compute. The network wasn't the, uh, the bottleneck here. It was actually the compute because we're doing um, all those, those reads and the aggregations and uh, group buys and filters and all that stuff in memory um, at query time, compute was on limitation. All right, uh, so, so we could just like spin up more retrievers, we could get more EC2 instances. I mean, you can buy compute, right? Except we really don't need it all the time. The retriever dog doesn't always wanna play. Uh, so this is like when we need the compute, this is a, the concurrency of how many lambdas are we running at any one time, and it's it's super spiky. Often, pretty much none. Sometimes, we need thousands. Um, and uh, this is very different from the compute profile of EC2 because we don't need it 30 seconds from now. 
uh, after you, I mean, even if an instance spun up that fast, which they don't all, um, that's too long. We need sudden access to compute while you're lifting your cup. And that is exactly what serverless provides. Also, lambdas are like right next door to S3, right? So, okay. So, okay, retriever, you get some minions. And now, um, when a retriever needs to access its segments in S3, it spins up a lambda for each eight or so segments. And that lambda reads the data from S3, decrypts it, looks at the, the files just that it needs to, does the aggregations, sends the intermediate result to retriever, and the map reduce operation uh, flows upward. This is much better. See, our query time, I mean, it still goes up with the number of segments queried, that's not weird, but it's very sublinear. And if you're running a 60-day query and it's a hard one, you might get more than one sip in, but you're not going to have to go get another cup. Win. Turns out that buying compute in used to be 100 milliseconds, now it's one millisecond increments. You can do it. And uh, this is like us scaling the compute so that the time of the query doesn't scale with how much it's doing. So we're kind of throwing money at the problem, but very precisely, like only when we need to. So we use Lambda to scale up compute in our database, and we found that it's fast enough. I mean, our, our median start time is like 50 milliseconds. That's, my cup doesn't get very far in, in that amount of time. It's okay. Uh, we don't see much of a difference between hot and cold startups, more on that in a bit. Uh, they tend to return within two and a half seconds, which is acceptable. And they are you know, three or four times more expensive, but we run them a hundred times less at least than we would an EC2 instance um, for the same amount of compute. So this works out. And there are caveats to all of these, uh, or at least caveats that we overcame. Uh, so <laughs> watch out. We started doing this a year ago, um, and a little over a year ago. And uh, AWS was, I mean, this was kind of a new use case at the time uh, for serverless because they designed it for web apps. They designed it as like a, a backend on demand. Um, so the scaling isn't exactly what we expected. Like <laughs> the, the scaling for Lambda is it'll go up to what it's called the burst limit, which in, in US East one is 500. In US West two, I think it's 3000. So it varies by region. Uh, but that burst limit is like 500 lambdas, and then they stop scaling. And there's, then it was just like, oh, oh, but if you have continuous load, then over the next minute, they will scale up. I think it might be linearly. I've drawn it as steps to the concurrency limit, which is like a thousand. Um, and the rest of them will get a 429 response, which is throttled for retry. So, uh, so, so we hit this <laughs> and uh, spending a minute scaling up by 500 more lambdas is not helpful because our usage pattern looks like this. We don't have a minute of sustained load. That doesn't help us at all. So we really needed our burst limit raised. And so we talked to AWS and they raised our burst limit. Um, you, can, you can talk to your rep and you can get your burst limit raised into the tens of thousands now. That helps. Or at least your concurrency limit. Both really. Um, the trick is to, to not, um, not surprise your cloud provider. So, uh, we were able to measure, uh, how many lambdas we needed to run at a given time or are running. Uh, in fact, we added this concurrency operator, um, to count how many of a thing at once, uh, just for this purpose. And now that's available to everyone. So, right. Startup. We need this to be fast. People talk about cold starts, warm starts. Is that a problem for us? It hasn't been. I mean, there's, uh, when you spin up or when you invoke a Lambda function, AWS may or may not have some already ready uh, of these processes already started up and ready. Um, and if not, it'll start up a new one and then uh, invoke it. Um, and then that one will hang out a little while waiting to see if it gets some more invocations. 
and you only get charged for while it's running the code. Um, yeah, so you can see the difference between these. In fact, uh, this is fun. This is fun. We can make a trace, and we do. Uh, we make a trace not only of our invocations, but of that wider Lambda process. Uh, because we emit a span when it wakes up, and we emit a span right before uh, the function goes to sleep. And so we can see run, sleep, run, sleep, run, sleep. You can actually follow uh, what's going on in that process, e even though during those sleeps it is not actively doing anything. I, I think that's fun. Uh, but generally ours start up within yeah, 50 milliseconds like you saw. This is in Go, so that helps. Oh look, here it goes. Here's the here's the the lambda function process. You can see that this one hung out for a while. And we can count the number currently running and we can use concurrency to count the number currently sleeping and you can see that those are wider. That's just kind of neat. <laughs> what matters is that uh, when we invoke them, they start up quickly, they do their processing, um, and they return within two and a half seconds most of the time, 90% of the time. Uh, but definitely not 100%. You can see uh, the 30,000 milliseconds or the 30 second um, line in the middle of this graph. There's kind of a cluster that's S3 timeout. So Lambda may be right next door to S3, but S3 does not always answer its knock. Uh, and the, I mean, the trick to this is just don't wait that long. <laughs> Start up another one with the same parameters and I hope you get a little luckier on the timing this time and S3 does respond. Watch out because the default uh, timeout in the Lambda SDK is like 30 seconds or longer. It's way too long. Do not want to use the default timeout. Make sure you give up uh, before the data becomes irrelevant. Okay, we did also find a peculiar restriction that like the functions can't return more than like six megabytes of data. So, okay, put the return value in S3 and send, respond with a link. Okay, um, it's it just, Amazon has the limit for everything. Uh, that's healthy, they have boundaries. <laughs> they will surprise you, <laughs> you will find them. Also, when we try to send the functions data, uh, we would like to send them uh, binary data, but they they only want JSON and there's weird stuff. JSON is not that efficient and it's not exactly JSON. It's whatever AWS's Lambda JSON cop has decided is JSON. <sighs> Don't deal with it. Put the input in S3 and send a link. This is fine. Finally, everyone knows that serverless is expensive. Per CPU second, it costs like three to four times what an EC2 instance would cost. I mean, given that it, we're running it less than a hundredth of the time as much, that seems like a win. Uh, but what can we do to keep that down? Well, first of all, what really worries me about Lambda costs is that you don't know what they're going to be. Uh, because how many of these are you going? Is, is your software going to invoke and suddenly spin up? And what are the costs associated with that? And are you going to get surprised by a bill that's like a quarter of your AWS bill? Sometimes. This is where observability is also really important. So because uh, we have spans that measure that invocation time, uh, we can multiply that duration by how much we pay per second of lambda invocation, and um, we can we can count that up by customer because all of our spans include customer ID as a dimension. And then we can get notified, and we do, whenever a particular customer uses more than like $1,000 of Lambda in a day or an hour. I forget which one it is. And then sometimes we, we get the account reps to reach out and talk to that customer and be like, what are you doing? <laughs> Here's a more effective way to accomplish what you're looking for. Um, and we, uh, we throttle our API and stuff like that. Uh, but really, the best you can do is find out quickly if you're going to get a big bill. Also, we do a ton of optimization. We do so much optimization of our Lambda execution, really 
all of our, our major database processes um, to get that speed. Um, one way that we optimize is that we've moved from x86 to ARM processors, to the Graviton 2 processors, uh, both, both for our retrievers and our ingest and most of our other um, servers, but also for our lambdas. So Liz Fong Jones, who's our field CTO now, uh, has written several articles about uh, the ARM processors are both faster in the sense that it's going to take less CPU to run them, and those CPU seconds are cheaper. Uh, so we get lower costs in two different ways. And we can measure that. Uh, so we, we started building our Lambda functions, there and go, for both x86 and ARM. And we, the first time, we tried a 50-50 split. And we ran into some, okay, how is maybe this, maybe not. Uh, the, uh, initially, the ARM64 processors um, were a, about the same average, but a lot more varied in their performance um, and overall slower. Okay, take it back. They were not the same average. They were more varied in their performance and overall slower. So we're like, okay, let's change that feature flag and we'll roll this back so we're running 1% on ARM processors and 99% on x86. And we did that. And um, yeah, so now you can see our ARM percentage. You can barely see the orange line at the end after the, the feature flag was deployed. And then we started investigating why. Why was it so slow? Well, one, one was capacity. Uh, even though we had our Lambda executions uh, limits raised, there were only so many ARM processors available to run them. Uh, the, the total capacity in AWS for these is still lower than for x86 Lambdas. Uh, so we had to work with AWS directly and created a capacity plan for when we would be able to spin up more and more of them to ARM. More on that later. Uh, the next thing we noticed was that uh, these were running slower because, uh, okay, so at the time, the current Golang was 117, and 117 had a particular optimization of um, putting parameters in registers instead of having to put them in memory for function calls that made uh, calling functions faster on x86. And because we're doing all these super complicated queries and which filter are we doing and which group by are we doing, and there's a lot, a lot of branching um, in what our aggregators are doing, uh, there are a lot of function calls. And so a little bit of overhead on a function call went a long way. Now go 1.18 uh, also has this optimization on ARM. Uh, so we started using 118 a little bit early just for our lambdas. And that made a difference. Now it goes 119, it's fine. But at the time, that was a significant discovery. So we figured that out with profiling. Um, and also through profiling, we noticed that the compression was taking a lot longer on uh, ARM than on x86. And it turned out that the LZ4 compression library had a native implementation on x86, but had not been released yet natively in assembly for ARM64. So Liz spent a couple afternoons porting the ARM32 assembly version of the LZ4 compression library uh, to ARM64, got that out, and brought the performance more in line. Uh, so, so these three considerations fixed the performance problems that we saw at the time. Although the capacity ones, that's a, that's a gradual fix over time. So since then, since a year ago, uh, we've been able to bump it up to 30% ARM. Uh, and then AWS called and said, hey, uh, try, go for it. And we bumped it up to like 99, but then there were some regressions. And so we dropped it down to 50 and that was okay. And then we got those fixed. And then uh, bumped it up to 90, or gradually worked it up to 99%. And now we're there. Uh, we keep 1% on x86 just so we don't break it without noticing. 
and the performance is good. Um, there's a little more variation in the purple x86 lines here than in, but that's just because they're one percent, and the orange lines are arm and yeah, the performance is the same. Oh, and we figured out um, also through profiling and observability uh, that on arm we with the same CPU size as x86. It was fa sufficiently fast enough that we'd actually hit network limitations. Um, so we we scaled back the CPU by 20%. Um, so on fewer CPUs, we're getting the same performance. And also those CPUs are 20% cheaper. Yay! This kind of continued optimization is how we manage to spend money very strategically on our database CPU so that people can get that interactive query timing, even over 60 days. All right, so we scaled up our compute with Lambda. Should you? I mean, think about it. Think about it. If you do, be sure to study your limits. Be sure to change the SDK retry parameters. Don't wait 30 seconds for it to come back. Deployment is its own thing. I haven't talked about that. And testing it is, uh, yeah, we stepped that out for automated tests. And hey, the only real test is production. So also test in production with, with, you, with good observability. Uh, observability is also really important for knowing how much you're spending. Because you can really only find that out, again, in production from minute to minute. And always, always talk to your cloud provider. Don't surprise them work this out with them, talk about your capacity limits. A lot of them are adjustable, but not without warning. But the question is, what should you do um, on serverless and what should you not? So uh, real-time bulk workloads. That's what we're doing. We're doing a lot of work while someone is waiting in our database. So um, it needs to be a lot of work or don't bother just run it on whatever computer you're already on and it needs to be urgent like a human is waiting for it or else there's no point spending the two to four times extra on serverless i mean unless you just really want to look cool or something no <laughs> run it as a kubernetes job run it on ec2 something like that if it's not urgent uh, so once you've got someone waiting on a whole lot of work then what you're going to need to do is move the input to object storage. You've got to get all of the input that these functions need off of local disk and somewhere in the cloud where they can access it. If they have to call back uh, to a retriever to get the data, that wouldn't help. And then you've got to shard it. You've got to divide that up into work that can be done in parallel. So it takes a lot of parallelism. Uh, the MapReduce algorithms that our, our lambdas are using have this. And then you'll want to bring that data together. You could do this in Lambda, uh, but, but this also can be a bottleneck. And we, we choose to do that outside of Lambda um, on our persistent uh, retriever instances, which are also running on ARM <laughs> for added savings. And then you're going to have to do a lot of work. I mean, you're spending money on this serverless comp compute. Use it carefully. You're going to need to tune uh, the parameters, like how many segments per invocation, what's the right amount of work for the right Lambda execution, um, how many CPUs do you need on Lambda at a time, and I think memory is connected to that, but watch out for things like when you're blocked on network, nothing, no more CPU is going to help you. Um, you'll need to optimize properly, and that means, I mean, performance optimizing your code where it's needed, you'll need profiling. Um, you definitely need observability and there's an open telemetry layer and it will wrap around your function and and uh, create the spans at the start and end um, and it's important to use a layer for this your function can't send anything after it returns nothing as soon as it returns <coughs> it's in sleep mode until it starts up again so you need um, the lambda layer allows something to happen to report on the return of your function. And be sure to measure it really carefully because <laughs> that's how you're going to find out how much you're spending. 
in the end, technology doesn't matter. It's not about using the latest hotness. And the architecture doesn't matter. It's not about how cool a distributed column store is. What matters is that this gives something valuable to the people who use Honeycomb. So we spend a ton of thought, a ton of development effort, a ton of optimization, a ton of observability. We put all of our brain power and a lot of money into our, our serverless functions, all to preserve that one most precious resource, developer attention. Thank you for listening. I look forward to taking your questions. And uh, if you want to learn more, you can find me at uh, honeycomb.io slash office dash hours or on Twitter as Jessitron. Uh, or you can like read our book. Uh, so Liz and George and Charity all from Honeycomb have written about uh, how we do this, how we do observability and how we make it fast in the observability engineering book. So you can learn a lot more about Retriever uh, in there. The end. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I, I love watching it. Um, is excellent, super in depth, and I think you already have quite a few questions. Um, one one person asked, "Great talk, Jessica. I was wondering how much data we're talking about when we say sixty days for large clients." Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it's in terabytes, but like okay. tens of terabytes, not high terabytes. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, I actually sort of had a question, just like a very basic question. Like, what's the normal workflow for your customer using the retriever function? Like, what's their normal method? Like, let's say you have a customer, they build a dashboard with charts. Do they basically say, okay, this chart, I want to be faster or more real time? Like, what's the, how do they move oh, to this? No, no. Uh, we just work to make everything fast. There's, okay. you, you don't pick custom indexes mm. um, and you don't like, pick which graphs to make fast, we aim to make all of them fast because we don't want you to be stuck with your dashboards. I mean, yeah, you can build a dashboard. That is a functionality that Honeycomb has, um, but it's not what we're optimizing for. We're really optimizing for the interactive experience. You might start at a dashboard, but then we expect you to click on the graph, maybe change the time range, maybe compared to last week, more likely group by a field or, or several fields. Um, and get little tables of the results as well as the uh, um, as well as many lines on the graph, and then maybe uh, click on uh, make a heat map or click on it and say what's different about these. And we're gonna go on a series of queries to tell you that. Oh, so it's completely done on demand in like real time as the user is doing his or her analysis. It, it's yeah. not about optimizing the speed of a chart in a dashboard. It's all about the right. interaction. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know what, I mean, I mean, we could go look in the database, what you have in your dashboards, but your dashboard queries are not any different from a live query. And do you also speed those up with retriever? The, the sort of the can set of charts that people have? Um, yes. If okay. like, if you make a dashboard that's for a long period of time, um, and access it a lot, we're probably going to notice and maybe talk to you because uh, we don't want, if you like updating that every 30 seconds, we're going to cache it for you <laughs> because those are expensive queries. Oh, but I think Tristan asked about when to use Lambda functions and when not to. Uh, it's whether the data is in S3. If it's in S3, it's, we're going to use a Lambda. If it's on local disk, then we're not. And that's entirely determined by uh, time. The time isn't the same for every data set, though. If you have a smaller data set, maybe all of the data is on local disk. I um, mean, as it gets bigger, more a larger percentage of that data is in S3. OK, uh, is it so good? Yeah. And. Oh, I see. So it's it's based on the data set size. And and then do you move the data to S3 like behind the scenes? Retriever does. Retriever. OK. Yeah. 
Oh, so like retriever, uh, depending on how, so is it a, you get to decide how much data you hold? Like if I want, do I get to decide if I want six months of data? Um, you can user, negotiate that a little yeah. bit with your contract. Like, okay. I, I think we have a few exceptions where customers keep more than 60 days of data in particular data sets. Mm. Um, but Honeycomb, I mean, we, we kind of keep things pretty simple. Uh, pretty much everybody had 60 days of data and mm. how much of that is in local disk is like a fixed amount per data set, roughly. Okay. Um, it, some data sets have more partitions than others. And so they'd have um, correspondingly more data on local disk, but it's all invisible to the mm. customer. You don't know when we're using Lambda. Okay, and then someone asked, Jacob asked, can you elaborate on what makes Lambdas hard to test? Oh, um, so <laughs> you can test the code inside the Lambda. You can unit test that is just fine, mm. but actually testing whether it works um, once it's uploaded to AWS, like integration, integration testing lambdas is really hard. You can't do that locally. You can't do that in a test environment. I mean, you can do that in a test version that you uploaded to AWS, uh, but that's slow. It's really slow. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, Honeycomb is all about test in production. Um, not that we only test in production, but that we also test in production and we notice when things break um, and then we roll back quickly. Uh, the other thing we do is we upload or we don't, we deploy um, to our internal environment first. And our internal environment is not, a, it's not test, it's not staging. It's a completely separate environment of Honeycomb that we're the only customer of. So there's there's production honeycomb that monitors everybody else's stuff, the, uh, all of our customers' observability data, and then there's our version of honeycomb that just receives data from production honeycomb. We call it dog food because we use it to eat our own dog food. Um, so the dog food honeycomb we deploy to that first. Technically, there's another one that monitors dog food, but close enough. Um, and so if we broke the interface uh, between um, Retriever and EC2. Actually, I think we just moved it to Kubernetes, but still, that's under that's on EC2 eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. Between Retriever on EC2 and then the lambdas, um, or anything else about the lambdas that we couldn't unit test. If we broke that, we'll notice it very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, we even have like uh, deployment gates that normally. Uh, the deployment to production would just happen 20 minutes later. But if um, if our if our SLOs uh, don't match, if we get too many errors in dog food, we'll automatically stop the deploy to production. Uh, so we test in prod where it's a smaller version of prod, right? It's not um, all of prod. It's a limited rollout, I guess. Got it. Um, great. Um, someone asked, uh, there are a few questions here. One is, how do you compare Lambdas to Knative? Have you? Well, done... personally, I don't. I've never tried anything in Knative. Okay. And um, neither have I. We do use Kubernetes in Honeycomb, but I, so I don't think are we are Are you using EKS, uh, Kubernetes over EKS? Mm -hmm. uh, the Elastic. EKS, yeah. Got it, for the control plane. Um, someone asked uh, this other question, which is, does it sometimes make sense to use a platform agnostic language like Java that may help avoid issues with suboptimal libraries that are not yet ported to native CPU architecture. What are Sometimes, the absolutely. It depends on your business case. Uh, I mean, we're doing something really specialized in this custom database. I mean, in general, don't write your own database. Um, and in general, don't optimize your code this much <laughs> for like business software. Uh, but this is like the secret sauce that makes Honeycomb special. This is what makes it possible for you to not have to decide which queries you want fast. They're just all fast. And we don't even, it's a dynamically generated schema. We don't even know what fields you're going to send us. Just that it's going to be fast. Um, so it's super specialized. And uh, at the scale that we do these particular operations at, it's expensive. Um, and that's where a significant portion of our costs are in AWS and a significant chunk of that is Lambda. So we are constantly optimizing to run really lean in AWS and we watch that closely. Liz Fung-Jones is um, 
is always noticing something that uh, that could be faster and could save us um, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a month, mm. which is significant at our our size. It, it, are you is your entire platform written in Go? Um, pretty much. I mean, the front end TypeScript. Okay, okay, that's very awesome. Uh, great questions from everyone. Um, let's see. Let's see if there are any others. Um, this was a very detailed talk. I, I took so many notes <laughs> during this. Uh, actually, yeah. we also I moved like the arm oh, from, uh, and we do real time streaming. And I mean, I, I'm going to go and check to see if we've seen we did a comparison with x86 before moving over to see if it affected our latency. Oh, I had a question. So um, is there ever a time, do you, do you see a case where, uh, like what are your time on? So user types in a query in, you know, in, the, in the UI, uh, how long will they wait? Will they wait as long as it takes to get a result, but you try to be as fast as possible? I mean, it'll time out after five minutes. Okay. Uh, but if, if it takes that long, there's a bug. I mean, well, more likely something went down. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah, that the the user waits until there's a little spinny thing, um, and I think okay. yeah, and then the query will populate. All the queries will populate all at once when the when the results have been aggregated and sent back. And usually, it's it's like five seconds on a long one, mm. um, and like two seconds on a typical query. But, um... I was also going to ask, I mean, this is the holy grail, like call cancellation. Someone closes the window, you yeah. you, you have to schedule the workload. I mean, that's, that's, everyone wants to do it, never gets around to it. Really yeah, hard. I mean, it'll, it'll finish what it's doing. There's no really stopping it because it's doing everything at once already. Yeah. Um, that now, uh, yeah. we will cache the results if it, somebody runs that exact query with that exact mm -hmm. time span again. Um, those results are actually stored in S3. This works for this makes permalinks work, um, so those results are actually stored forever. So that your your queries that you've already run that you've like put into your uh, your incident review notes, um, those will always work. Mm. You just won't be able to drill further in once the data is timed out. Uh, and what's the uh, time granularity of your buckets? Is it like your, your time? Oh, time? Uh, you can set that on the graph with, okay. within a range. Um, so it'll usually start at a second, but you can make it 30 minutes. You can make it uh, five milliseconds, Please depending on I mean, depending on your time range. You're not going to do five milliseconds for a 60-day query. That No, yeah. <laughs> but appropriately. But they could group by a second. You support group buys where they have one second buckets. Oh, uh, that's that's just bucketing for like the heat maps. Yeah. Group by is more like a SQL group by where you can group by account ID. You can uh -huh. group by region. You can any of the attributes and it'll okay. divide those out separately and show you a heat map that you can like cover with and i mean create a free honeycomb account and try it okay thank you <laughs> i definitely will this is really awesome i think we're at time um and i don't see any more questions coming in but if anyone does have any questions how would they reach you uh jessitron on twitter is easiest um jessitron at hackyderm.io on mastodon Oh, great. I am um, in the Slack, but I don't promise to check it again after like five minutes from now. You're a busy person. You're already at another, you're at multiple conferences. So uh, we yeah, appreciate yeah. your time, Jessica. And right anyone who wants to reach out to her, Jessitron on Twitter. Thank you very much for your time.